Valerie, can you hear me? I can. Okay. I'll take that as a yes from everyone involved. So welcome back uh, to the next session here in our U.S. Alone Summit. I am so thrilled to be able to kick us off together in the session today and in our true hybrid <laughs> capacity and having our panel, as happens in COVID times, being split up and being both in person and on our screen here. And again, a tremendous thank you to AIG for helping us make sure we had the technology to make all of this possible. This is Talent Development and CSR, a game-changing partnership for impact. And one of the ways I want to queue up this session ahead of being able to introduce my esteemed panelists, I suppose my, my sort of fireside chat colleagues, <laughs> if we had a little fire, uh, fireplace going behind us, is that across all the different pro bono summits we've had the chance to hold in prior years, particularly when having the chance to dig in from the practitioner perspective. So from the source often of volunteers, either on the corporate front or from other intermediaries, one of the questions that comes up time and time again or what are ways that we can help ensure that pro bono service programs can become more deeply embedded, can become sustainable truly within this ecosystem of the work, and can improve and grow over time. And when you pose that question to someone within a business, they will almost always say, oh, that's the exact job description of our fill in the blank name of the department, our people and culture department, our human capacity function, our human resources function. There is so much opportunity when we can think about this type of programming, not just in a particular department, in a particular box, in a particular set of parameters, but starting always first and foremost from the needs that we are all partnering together to support and address, and then putting together the building blocks that can make the most effective and impactful and connected programs happen. So if we had the chance to have a combined sort of raising of hands in the room and online, which I won't force you to do both virtually or in person, one of the things we also typically have asked in the past is within any given company, what is the relationship between HR and CSR? And when we have actually asked that question in surveys before, we generally find the answers fall across two poles on opposite sides. One is that there's actually an acrimonious relationship because these functions have largely been pitted against each other within a company to compete for what is often labeled as discretionary dollars. And then the other end of the extreme at times is that the function that actually brings these programs to life exists within this broader HR department. But a lot of folks otherwise kind of fall in this in-between space where there is zero relationship between the two. And we at Taproot have found over all of the amazing programs we've had the chance to be a part of and support and grow some of the most meaningful impact and some of the most deeply sustained and growing programs are those that come to life through a deep and thoughtful partnership between, you know, everyone uses their own names for it, but between the sort of CSR and HR functions. And I am so excited to be able to bring to you today in real time, the leaders of programs across two companies who I think are extraordinary examples of what it looks like when you can build these thoughtful partnerships <clears throat> in order to truly invest in the way these programs can come to life. So I'm really pleased to introduce Valerie Chord, who is the VP of Corporate Citizenship and Sustainability at RBC, and also the Executive Director of the RBC Foundation. And in that capacity, she's responsible for developing an integrated strategy that is aligned across RBC's purpose and business objectives. And through that, creating positive social, economic, and environmental impacts, which I wish that could be everyone's title, Valerie. That's really an extraordinary job, an extraordinary way to be able to describe how important this work is. And Jessica Clancy, who some of you had the chance to meet a little bit earlier, who is the Vice President of Cor Corporate, excuse me, Social Responsibility at Comcast NBC Universal, and in that work also oversees the work of the NBC Universal Foundation, and really has the chance to work across functions to build, manage, and grow strategic partnerships. So thank you both for being here today and for representing with you the deep partnerships and work that happen within your companies. And what I want to start, a, start us off with today is the chance to put a question to each of you, which is when it comes to your pro bono service programs, what you really see as this incredible opportunity in creating a partnership and what some of those considerations or barriers have been for folks as they think about bringing these partnerships to life. And Valerie, I thought I would kick it to you first to shine a little light on what this has looked like in RBC and what you'd advise others to think about. 
Oh, that's great. Thanks so much. And it's a real pleasure to be uh, with you. So I'm just going to do a check. And if you can give me a thumbs up, Lindsay, if everything is nice and clear, perfect. You know, when, when Lindsay first approached me on this, this topic, I actually had to take a step back and think about what is our relationship between uh, HR and our program here at, at RBC, we call it uh, corporate citizenship. Um, because it's really been quite a journey. And, and I would start first by um, just sharing that it's really important to demystify what we mean by HR, what we mean by corporate citizenship or CSR um, across both groups. That was a real learning for, for, for me. And I would just say uh, a learning perhaps for you. When you think about HR, HR is big. It can include learning and development. It can include recruitment, it includes compensation and benefits, um, and it includes the employee value proposition. So, so first you have to really understand what's HR within your organization, what are their priorities, what's ahead in terms of the things they want to accomplish, and how are they going to be judged in terms of measurement of success um, over the course of the year, or what's their business plan around HR. So that, that's the first piece, I would say. And very similar, we needed to do to do the same with respect to what we're doing with respect to corporate citizenship. What are the programs that we're trying to build? What's our corporate citizenship strategy? Where do the role of employees fit into this uh, journey? And then how do these two pieces come together to actually shape uh, outcomes and programs that are actually beneficial to both and roll up to ultimately for RBC? What's the purpose of RBC in terms of helping clients thrive and communities prosper? And so that would be the first takeaway that I have here in terms of really understanding um, what, you know, how do we see this partnership uh, evolving in this light? Um, I can get into examples later, but the other piece I would share is the real uh, importance of uh, timing. In many cases, we try to build programs throughout the course of, of my last seven years at RBC, and the timing wasn't there. So, you know, currently at this stage, we're really uh, double, um, HR is really focusing on the employee value proposition and the employee brand. So at this point, we're shaping some of the programs that are aligned to that specific uh, area. About two years ago, they started focusing on a leadership development. And then we thought that these were real opportunities for us to work together in terms of what is a social impact leadership development program. How could that um, accentuate and roll up and deliver on some of the uh, programs and priorities that HR needed to do? So I've got loads of examples on this, but my first uh, takeaway is better share and communicate what each of your business uh, imperatives are and how do then um, how do you go one plus one equals five uh, not just one plus one equals uh, two or less than two in that respect I love that I think demystifying what each function within the business does and what really defines success what they're held to what they're aspiring to do there's so much potential there when you can really come to that shared understanding and then dig in and, and build something from there so I'm excited to get into and have more of those examples shared, but I want to pose the same question to you, Jessica. What has this looked like? Um, what have you learned within NBC Universal? Thank you for having us. Um, so what's very unique about NBC Universal is that we agree with our HR function. We actually affectionately call it the talent lab, but for the purposes of this conversation, we can call it NBC University. Um, but we agree that um, inclusive leadership, empathy, cultural competencies are the traits we wanna see in employees. And so that is well known throughout NBC Universal and throughout our organization. So from a CSR perspective, it actually was a beautiful partnership because we knew going into the conversation that that is a priority of the company and that's a priority for employees. And we were able to bring our talent lab programming like Pro Bono and others that we felt like accelerated those leadership characteristics. And so I think really defining and understanding what are the competencies that your HR group wants employees to um, invoke at your organization and how in our, in our example, you can use service as a way to accelerate that. And so we've been able to build out a stream of programming that really leans into that ethos 
Um, but one thing Lindsay and I were talking about, which I, I do think is worth mentioning, is that before we had the Talent Lab at MBCU, um, actually the idea for skills-based volunteering originated out of HR. Um, and it originated with sort of a really rudimentary program called HR for Good, um, which is exactly what it sounds like and was probably more of your traditional program that still exists today in some capacity, but was very much our HR employees wanting to give their skills back to the community and doing so through pro bono consulting. So having that to build on and to kind of build our ecosystem of pro bono has been really helpful because we had sort of that initial buy-in about where it started and that came from an executive leadership position. So, but I think NBC Universal is very unique because the talent lab in its own right is both a physical space and a stream of programming and, and a set of principles that we all agree on. And so we're able to build around that. Yeah, I love that example in particular too, because for folks who are here with us today coming from the corporate side of things, if any of the initial examples I shared with you resonated with you about needing to kind of thaw out what might be a challenging relationship or a non-existent relationship between the sort of CSR and HR function to actually have folks from within that function be among the first to pilot engaging in pro bono service can be an incredibly meaningful opportunity yeah. and accelerate in some mm -hmm. cases that, that pathway towards bringing this to life. So I'd love now to start making this real and jump into some examples. So I'm gonna kick it back over to you, Jessica. Yeah. But love for you to begin sharing with folks what it has looked like yeah. when you can engage in this type of partnership and bringing this programming to life. What has the programming been able to include you sure. know, based on that? Yeah, and I, and I would, you know, remiss if it, 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 it wouldn't look like it does without partners like Tap, Taproot and our friends at Pixera Global are here as well in the room, right? Part of our strategy is really identifying experts in the space who are already doing this with other companies. So we don't necessarily have to recreate the mechanisms and framework to implement them at NBC. So thank you, thank you to all of you. Um, but what it has looked like is, is and first getting proximate to what employees want, right? We've heard from employees that they're all on a different journey as many of you had. Um, and so much of what they want and what they told us they want is deeper transformational service learning experience. And so um, we've been able to take that nugget and uh, build out a, a suite of pro bono programming at, at NBC Universal that really meets employees where they are in their journey, right? We have 30,000 plus employees. Of course, everybody's on a different journey. Some of them don't wanna be on a journey with us at all and that's fine. And then some of them wanna be really deeply engaged. So we have, three programs to date that meet employees where they are. We have our sort of more traditional half day consultation program. We have a business led pro bono program. And then we have our, you know, I call it our Cadillac version, which is our talent lab. And that is a program in which um, employees, who, employees are nominated to the experience and it is a learning and development and service experience. And they're nominated uh, by their HR leaders because they meet specific criteria. Right? So we were talking earlier about um, how do you make sure that employees are sort of representative across the company. So we do that through uh, a nomination a set of criteria to make sure they embody DEI principles, that, they've cert that they have experience in service and volunteering, they show interest, they have leadership potential, and they're folks in the company we want to invest in. And then we build out a multi-week uh, uh, pro bono experience. And so what I will say, the advantage, again, that we have at NBC is to come back to the talent lab because the talent lab is already an existing brand. So maybe some of you have some of these existing brands or programs at your company that you can align with. The talent lab was already a well-known brand within the company, which folks were eager to get into. They were eager to get into a training in the talent lab. So being able to leverage that really accelerated, I think the way that we've been able to uh, build pro bono within the company versus really starting on our own. So that goes to the collaboration a uh, point that you were making earlier, as well as how you work closely with your colleagues to lean into something that's already there from an infrastructure perspective. That's great. And Valerie, I know you have so many incredible examples of what collaboration has looked like as your various programs have come to life. Would love to give you the floor now to share a bit about that. And um, one thing I know you brought up before in prior conversations, I wanted to note now as well is very similarly to what you were hearing uh, from Jessica, there is so much space and opportunity for learning, for development in the experience of this work, but always, of course, starting from the shared philosophy that with this service, you are bringing the new capabilities to the table. Folks are bringing the skill set, that specific match, you're being nominated for the right fit. 
and now the ability to be able to enhance and lean into different competencies in a new and different environment um, in a different setting can bring so much uh, added experience there. So Valerie, would love to kick it over to you for some of your examples. Well, I wanted to also kind of ground this in terms of you now where does this program belong as part of our broader corporate citizenship strategy. And about seven years ago, we decided that we needed to revamp that strategy. And so, you know, I won't go through all the levers, but the real key ones are we needed to focus on key societal issues in terms of corporate citizenship. Part number two was if we focus, we could bring a more than money approach to solving for those issues. And the third was really uh, ensuring that we were developing an impact measurement framework so that we could hold ourselves accountable uh, in this light. So with these three pillars, and if you take pillar number two in terms of a more than money approach, a real lever in our more than money approach was our talent. We needed that commitment to make it really easier for our talent to uh, get involved and contribute to the broader social impact that we were looking to achieve. So that was the context in which with we actually continued to evolve some of our programming. And the one that I'll talk about, actually two of them, the first is, is Ignite. And that is a program that is shaped to really grow talent, uh, our BIPOC talent, and provide them with a um, kind of uh, bespoke uh, opportunities in this regard. And the other is related to a social uh, impact leadership uh, program. So we call it SILP. And in both of those cases, uh, the opportunity is to, again, in both cases, employees are nominated to participate in this, um, in this program. Um, they get uh, partnered up with a charitable partner. And then it's a 12-week it's a program that really works uh, in terms of collaboration with uh, Taproot. Taproot is a real strong partner in this regard. And I will just talk a little bit about why that's so important in a minute. But a, they work together on solving some really complex problems for uh, or challenges for our charitable partners in this regard. Um, surrounding the, um, the framework that we have there is uh, a series of, of advisors. So each project has an advisor from, from uh, uh, the Royal Bank and also an executive sponsor. So it actually um, imparts, let's say we have 30 partners, 30 partners uh, times six in terms of a program has about 180 employees that participate plus another 30 executive sponsors and 30 executive um, advisors. So the, the amount of, of people that are involved in this journey is uh, becoming significant. And I would say a couple of things. It needs to be really important for, uh, not only for the employees that are participating to have a really positive um, and meaningful experience, but it's also the same for our charitable partners. And we were very, uh, became very um, uh, important for us to recognize our, our influence. We are one of Canada's largest corporate funders. Uh, we have a budget of close to $170 million a year. And we just felt that in some cases, when we were inviting our partners to participate, they kind of felt like they had to submit a project or do something in this regard. And that was not going to lead into a really positive experience for both our, uh, the partner and also the, uh, the employees that were participating. So we made it really clear that this is, um, you know, the submission of a, of a project was really key and that we needed to have a, uh, a person or a partner that would really help make sure that the partners understood what they needed to sign up for. You know, they needed they needed a project manager. They needed to be sure that the the, the project was was very well defined. Um, that they were committing to the twelve weeks because you've got a group of six people who are looking to deliver on 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 the commitment as well. So that kind of relationship really needed to be done. Uh, well, and then we needed to make sure that we were really clear with respect to what were we looking to achieve for both the uh, the social impact, but also the leadership development opportunities. And then we partnered with a few other um, people who are also rounding out the leadership development program to fulfill some of those expectations as well. And then at the end of the, the session, we then close it off with really a deep dive to for the lessons learned from the charitable partner, but also with respect to the advisors and then the also the, the employees that have participated. And that's really helped us 
you know, course correct and improve the program uh, overall. But I would just say at this stage, we have a, a waiting list to get on the program because it's become so much pop, so popular and people have really felt that they have um, really gained a significant amount of both leadership uh, opportunities and capabilities and skills, but also a real uh, enhanced visibility of the social um the not-for-profit and charitable sector. And many people just don't really have real visibility of getting under the hood and seeing what really happens and how do organizations really uh, evolve. So uh, that's kind of our, our program in, in a nutshell. And I can uh, answer some more specific questions as, as needed. Well, one, I think, great segue from there, and I want to have the chance to pose this question to both of you mm -hmm. as well, is thinking about how this programming has also been supported by and is in support of the overall purpose and culture within your company. One thing that I think is both so representative of that, but also seems to be a core contributing part of that as well from your examples too, Valerie, is the depth of that executive presence and involvement, the commitment of having advisors in addition to participants on teams speak so clearly to the dedication internally to this programming and not just as a program in and of itself, but for how deeply it also relates to the overall purpose and mission and focus of RBC. Can you speak a little bit to how this programming and work has been able to be so deeply connected to the company's culture overall? Well, it's definitely connected to our, it's just part of the culture. I, I actually just didn't believe that that was the case when I first joined um, RBC. I came from, from Deloitte and Deloitte has, uh, you know, a, an unbelievable culture as well, but there's just something different with respect to, um, I would just say that the closeness of, of RBC in community, and if you kind of think about the history in a Canadian context, it's a little bit different in the US where we have more of our capital markets and wealth management uh, businesses, but in, um, in Canada, you know, the history of, of a bank is being in community. You've got a branch, like you are in community because you belong to that community. And so that, that relationship is really, really close. So it's just already part of the culture. Uh, would be point number one. But I would just say, if you look at the Edelman uh, belief driven um, survey, uh, I just feel like it, 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 there is a moment in time where we really do have an opportunity of engaging our employees uh, in a different, more meaningful way to really rebuild or build a sense of belonging in a way that um, really, again, adds value to society, but also adds value to, to the company as well. So it's becoming more and more evident that, you know, employees expect um, companies to, to take a stand where a stand needs to be uh, taken to um, lead with intention and authenticity. And that is also um, translated in terms of providing employees with an opportunity to do more within the realm of their day-to-day -day work. And I, and I do find that's going to be a strategic differentiator. Uh, moving forward, the ability of finding opportunities for those two uh, pieces to come together. So thank you for that. And Jessica, I know you were already referencing Talent Lab, sure. NBC University. Yep. Can you speak a little bit to how this has played a role and is a part of the overall culture in the company? Yeah, and I mean, I think that, so like being nominated into a Talent Lab is sort of gives the program some gravitas. And so I think as you think about our holistic strategy, it was very intentional um, and um, you know, from an MBC perspective, it was the first time in which we took our learning and development and infused it intentionally with service learning and volunteering, right? And so it very much made the statement that service learning and volunteering were core components of how we wanted to develop employees and how we fundamentally believe that uh, service learning and volunteering develop employees. And I will say a big part of that, just very tactically, is that, um, when we build pro bono, the whole first part of the day is about the employee. It's about empathy, it's about leadership, and it's about connection. All of those skills are translatable to when they go and consult with a nonprofit in the pro bono setting. But we spend the first part of the day helping them get close to those skills, make connections with other employees around the company. And we actually work with a, another partner that we support, Narrative 4, um, which really believes in the power of story and we help people learn through each other's stories. And so there they practice deep listening, empathy, and um, really get close to you know, other folks and where they're from 
and you take all of that into your consultation with your nonprofit, they have a much bigger and broader perspective, right? We really sort of widen the aperture of what it means to connect with a nonprofit um, and how to provide service. So I think that is very u- unique to us. And I'll, I'll just say that, you know, one way we know it's working is that we have businesses now who come to us all the time, who have people who've been involved in our talent lab and say, how do I do a pro, how do I stand up a pro bono experience with just my business? And Taproot helped us do that specifically with film, which is of course a huge business of NBC Universal. We're about to do it with news, of course, another huge business at NBC Universal. Um, and we've been able to see with some of our DEI councils and some of our other inclusion committees, just their teams um, identifying nonprofits that are close to their work and setting them up for success in pro bono consulting. So we know that we have our signature, but we, we also know that a huge part of that journey and making sure that it is successful in the organization is if we can get the businesses to adopt it. Yeah. And I think that that piece about how this can also go so far in helping to make this an effective and deeply sustainable program within the company also speaks to what this can mean for the field at large. Mm-hmm. So wearing my taproot hat and sort of zooming out or widening the aperture, um, using your term, which I like to think of as like an NBC News uh, <laughs> filming nod there. Um, one thing I think is so important and that we believe in so deeply too, is that this is all a part of really spreading the pro bono ethic. So mm-hmm. in any one company, we want there to be incredibly impactful pro bono programs. But what it also means is that the professionals who are participating in this who then get to be a part of a company where this is part of the culture of the company and not just limited to a sort of checklist of any one program, they bring it with them. Mm -hmm. They go to another company and now as a marketing professional, as an HR professional, as a finance professional are asking where the pro bono program is or how they're able to engage in their skills in this way. So for our audience members, regardless of where you might be, if you're within a company or across other sectors, when we think about what it means to spread the pro bono ethic, so much of that also gets into the ability to really sustain and grow this whole ecosystem of support because folks are bringing it with them in the culture and in leadership positions as they advance um, and move through their careers as well. So I want to make sure we're leaving time for questions for folks in the room and for folks online. So I'm going to give you that little seed plant right now so you can think of or start to pose the questions you'll have. And I'm going to take my turn first with a question, which is both of you have had the chance now to be a part of such incredible programs and programs that have grown so substantially since your first interactions with them. Would love to hear from you. What's one key learning or insight or piece of advice you would love to have gone back in time to tell yourself or your colleagues when you were first beginning this journey, and in particular in the relationship between the sort of HR and CSR functions in bringing programming to life. And I'll let whoever the spirit moves first, I'll let you chime in. Um, I mean, I think it goes back to the theme of collaboration um, and that you really, it sounds a little, it sounds trite, but you really have to have sort of buy in across the different stakeholders. Because like any program, you know, without resources, without real investment, and that's really where the Taproot Pixera relationship comes in, right? Like we need real investment to Valerie's point to scope the right project, to match the right skills, to make it scalable. And so I think realizing that it is, you know, it is beyond transactional volunteering and there has to be, you know, this core alignment, real investment and real true spirit of collaboration um, to move a program like this forward. I'll build on that. And I, you know, real learning is defining the intention of the program. So, you know, you've got two, two areas. So, um, the first, and it's interesting, the first pro bono uh, or significant pro bono work that we did was actually very similar. It didn't come from HR, it came from our strategy um, team. We've got an internal strategy team uh, within the bank and they said, oh, you know, we, we'd love to be able to, to take our strategy knowledge and apply it to a charitable partner. And so they, we helped them. We did a first matchup and then we used that as a, as a, a learning uh, in terms of uh, you know, rolling out the program and building it and, and expanding it and also getting, you know, developing the business case to do so. So I think that was um, just, just building on that. A lot of this insight and innovation often comes from within and you, and you just have to find ways of, of incubating it and, and growing it and being the voice of, 
for that. So that just one, one point there. But the second point is, yeah, define what the program's intention is. Is it to deliver social impact and to grow and provide value to the charitable partner? Is it to define and grow the leadership capabilities for your talent? Is it to uh, globalize your workforce? Is it to deepen a sense of belonging and therefore you're going to uh, create teams that are um, present across lines of business and you're trying to you know, build a cohesiveness and, and sharing and learning around uh, the different parts of your, of your organization? It's just really important to be clear in terms of what you're trying to achieve and also be clear as how are you going to measure the success? Is it going to be a post survey? Is it going to be, um, you know, how, how you scaled an, an offer profit to do even, even more and better things? So, but because if, if you're not clear, you're not going to have a clear uh, path in terms of what you're trying to shape. And a clear example is if you are leadership development driven, you may you know, focus on that and, and, and create opportunities that are better anchored for leadership. And that might be at, at the detriment of the quality of the project that you're going to do, uh, deliver for a not-for-profit because it won't be the best people to perhaps deliver um, what um, an, a charitable partner might actually need in terms of a new cybersecurity uh, program or a new HR strategy or so forth. So you just need to really be clear so that you're shaping everything else in light of the intention of the program. It seems, it seems evident, but it's really not. And only when you really call it out and then you shape it, then you find ways of actually meeting a number of criteria. But it's just important to call out what is the criteria? What's this program for? And, and how are you going to measure success? Thank you. I will pause on my questions then to see if there are questions we should open ourselves up to, either with our virtual audience or with folks in the room. Yeah. Ask your question, then I'll repeat it back on our uh, yeah. loud mics here. I'm Josh Koenig with the Thompson Reuters Foundation. I think both of the speakers, I'm just so impressed at the really innovative ways that you've integrated HR and CSR. And I'm wondering kind of about the elephant in the room, which is ESG, which has really been growing, I think, in organizations. Where are you at in your journey in terms of integrating that as another team and function organizationally that really intersects with your CSR work? And I guess just to keep it brief, kind of just what are the initial kind of considerations or questions you're thinking about and have you learned from these past initiatives at all when you're integrating the SG? So for those who wouldn't have been able to hear it quite as easily, starting thoughts on ESG and how you're seeing um, that opportunity for integration, for overlap. I'm overly paraphrasing. <laughs> Hopefully folks can also see on our wonderful live transcription, um, the more thoughtful and detailed version of the question, but what are you starting to see or experience or think about as it relates to this, I think you call the elephant in the room topic, you know, certainly in the corporate realm of ESG. I can, I can kick it off if you, if you like. Um, so, you know, our, I, I think it's important to to say that there's an awful lot of of um, I would call it a lot of noise around around uh, ESG in this respect. Uh, we've kind of pulled it back and said, you know, we would call it we've anchored our purpose and ESG together, so we call it purpose driven ESG in this in this respect. And how we've shaped our ESG construct is, in fact, what are the major uh, areas we need to focus on around our ESG pillars? For RBC, it's climate, it's DNI, it's youth success, and it's financial well-being. In addition to the big G areas that we just need to do and you know to earn the trust and 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 be a strongly governed uh, financial institution. So if that's those are the biggest construct around ESG. Um, in this respect, this falls right into um, the way that we deliver on that. So in order to deliver on those focus areas for us on, on, in terms of ESG, we then bring our more than money approach. We bring our uh, impact measurement uh, framework. We bring all of the collective assets to deliver on the objectives of each of those specific pillars that roll up again uh, in terms of how we report on and disclose around ESG. So it is very much aligned um, within the construct of ESG. And I would view talent and what we want to uh, achieve in this regard as a really big horizontal. So we bring 
in this case, this program to deliver on much of the uh, aspects of the ESG pillars. So um, it's a very good question. And I would I just take comfort that you don't need to uh, overcomplicate it. You just need to call out what are the areas you're focusing on in terms of your ESG, which are the uh, which are the ESG um, uh, topics and issues that you that are relevant for you to take on within your organization, and then you bring again these programs to uh, to be in alignment with that. To use your word uh, from an earlier question, it sounds like this is another really valuable area for that demystifying step to yeah. add so much value. Because once we break it down from the letters to the actual needs, the goals, the substance, and you start to see where different initiatives already overlap and align. And, and then also too, I'm sure, where there are gaps and where there's important opportunities as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't, um, NBC Universal uh, rolls up the Comcast. Um, and so, you know, we have that additional um, sort of oversight and framework that to Valerie's point, we're really rolling to, and so we we report together, and, and you'll see that in our impact report, um, in which we address sort of what our ESG principles are um, and how they're integrated into the company. But it's definitely you know it's not binary in the sense of that you know this sits over here, and this sits over here. I think those you know those same principles apply where you know it environment or sustainability as a function may sit within operations because that where that's where it makes the most amount of sense, but collectively everybody who touches um, some form of ESG comes together and agrees again on what are our purpose, what's our impact, how are we going to deliver on that, and then we agree on that collectively. I don't think we answered the second part of the question. And was it, was it about, can you remind me, was it about learning or is it about like, um, is that, was that the second part? I if you have another question in the room, I'm happy to come. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Offering the floor to another question in the room if there is one, and if not, happy to love it back and have you add to it. Yeah, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, I was curious, what was the impetus for your company to start these programs in the first place? Did that come from a general culture shift within the organization? Did it come from the employees themselves? Or was it perhaps maybe even suggested by your clientele? The impetus to start these programs in the first place, coming from employees, coming from elsewhere within the company, clientele. I mean, ours was our employees. I mean, it's Universal is maybe more unique than other large companies. The employees are at the center of everything that we're doing in terms of CSR. Um, and we've been really um, sort of transparent and thoughtful and, and vocal about that. So yeah, we surveyed our employees in a pulse survey sort of pre-COVID you know, where are we, where do we want to be, where do we want to go? And, and one thing that we heard a lot of was, you know, how do we promote and provide, you know, deeper transformational voluntary experiences. And so, um, but also I think part of our role in, in CSR is, and we use this phrase internally all the time, but is to meet the moment um, and to think about, you know, this kind of current moment that we're in and, and how, how are our volunteering programs meeting the moment? And we know that, um, employees want to be closer to our philanthropy, they want to be closer to our grant giving, they want to be closer to solutions in communities, and pro bono is a way in which we can deliver on that. So it's a combination of, of both. And then, again, the kind of special sauce of the leadership development. That's a core sort of goal of the company, and this helps us get there. So, um, but yeah, really starting with employee feedback and, and meeting employees where they are. What about an RBC, Valerie? Yeah, I would say it's the same. I would say the um, we've had a number of programs for over the course of a number of years. So the, the programs around employee volunteering and helping our employees uh, volunteer has been and rewarding them for for their their actions has has been in place for a number of years. We've got our employee um, giving programs. We have opportunities of employees doing missions to learn about some of the key programs. We've done that for climate, for DNI and so forth. How do we engage them to learn about some of the things that we do um, and engage them in that way? So we have a, a series of programs to to um, I, you know as was mentioned meet meet them on their journey and, and make sure that they are able to participate in that way. And then it was really an evolution of how um, how can you take uh, and recognize all the things that we do and, and the, um, the value that we could bring beyond 
um, you know, either picking up garbage or painting this or, or doing that, um, helping our partners understand that we actually, you know, um, we have HR professionals, we have uh, legal professionals, we have technology professionals, we have all of these things that are that that can be, add value in a, in a greater way. So that really started with evolution of, of volunteering, the creation of a program that would make it uh, easier to do skills based volunteering in this regard, the testing, you know, with um, with the employees in our strategy group that wanted to do this and applied it. The law group that does it regularly, because, you know, if you're in a legal profession, um, pro bono is, is core to what you do. We also leverage that group. So you had these pockets across the organization that were starting to think about this. And it just became the right thing for us to do to actually test it with a few pilots and then better engage HR in that in that respect around leadership development. So that came I would say we probably started the, the, the program and then leadership development came in through HR and then we continue to evolve and, and grow the program. That's definitely a shared theme too, yeah. the ability and the opportunity to pilot, learn from that, and then to grow and expand now to such, I mean, truly large scale, far reaching and diverse programs in terms of the different types of pro bono programming you have. For folks who are maybe just getting started on the practitioner side, you can start with one project. You can start with one department and have the opportunity to really grow it from there, which is great for folks, I think, to have the chance to hear real life examples of and from different industries. Yeah, well. I mean, I'll, the only other thing I'll say is that we know that skills-based volunteering is critical. And, you know, we recently launched um, uh, what we're calling the Creative Impact Lab, which is NBC Universal kind of standing up its social purpose around storytelling and us becoming the home of storytellers uh, telling the stories of other nonprofits. And a, a big layer of that is skills-based volunteering. We are obviously home of creatives. And so how do we even take the, the creative community at MBC and, and allow them to flex their skills for a, a, a product which ends up being a marketing video or tick, TikTok or sizzle reel for nonprofits, but rather than just sort of sourcing that work out to other agencies, we bring in our uh, employees and they offer their skills-based volunteering. And I bring that up because it is not as formalized, let's say, as our talent lab, but it is the same principles and the same idea. And it's because we have so much momentum from our pro bono programming um, across the company that we're able to take that and layer the idea of skills-based into another core priority of the company. And I think some of those videos and examples yeah. are available online yes. now. It's it, really inspiring and such an incredible way to amplify mm -hmm. the stories of these incredible organizations that are doing this. All right, I think we are at time now. I always hate to cut off questions, but it also warms my pro bono heart that there are more <laughs> questions to be asked and you can definitely expect continued dialogue and follow up from us on this topic and sharing out of this information following from here. So a tremendous thank you to Valerie, to Jessica, for your time today, for opening up um, about your experiences and what you and your colleagues and your companies have had the chance to do, and to our audience members for jumping in and starting to engage with us on this topic. We're excited to continue to be able to have examples like this. And for those of you who I didn't force to have you raise your hands, where you might be within a company where there is maybe a not so warm relationship between the two functions, I hope there's a little something you've been able to take from this and start the process of thawing that. And for those where this might be the first opportunity to engage together, it sounds like between demystifying what the functions do within a company and what you're each aspiring to achieve and what that looks like, maybe piloting and having folks engage from the outset, and then bringing in the assets that can often come within your talent function, bringing in partners like Narrative4 to be able to engage in these best practices and thoughtful training can really, as Valerie said, I think, turn one plus one into five uh, in the way these programs can come to life. So thank you both. Thank you. We are now gonna have a brief break until 3.15 Eastern. When we're coming back together for a session, I'm incredibly excited about that in some ways brings together pieces of what you had the chance to learn about from Francis earlier, some of the insights from this conversation, and being able to talk about some incredibly thoughtful program design from Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina, Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina Foundation, some of the partners in the field, um, and some roots who are part of that program. So brief break until 3.15 Eastern, and looking forward to bringing you all back into that conversation.